Hi, I'm Bethany Hughes and I study the human story through time and I'm investigating some of the key questions of life in the time it takes to have a cup of tea using thousands of years worth of art and culture as my evidence and I'm lucky enough to be joined by some of the very brightest minds on the planet to help unravel these mysteries. Today, my question is why as humans do we need superheroes and who better on earth to discuss that with than Neil Gaiman who is passionate and an aficionado in all things super. For you, what is a superhero? I think you can trace the roots back to heroes and back to gods. But superheroes really are these fabulous things that start really in the 1930s in four color comics in America. I think it really is that kidhood that created the superheroes. The fact that Siegel and Schuster who created Superman, they were 15, 16 when they created Superman. Bob Kane was definitely under 18 when he signed and created Batman. It's ultimately aspirational. It's about the idea of, if only I was this, they couldn't do this to me. Those people who don't like me would have to like me, but they wouldn't know it was me, which is a gloriously, wonderfully pubescent thing to think where you're dealing both with the idea of wanting to be loved and respected and also desperately craving anonymity and to be like everybody else. It's so interesting, that comparison with the ancient myths and legends. We forget that a lot of those great figures like, you know, Achilles, they probably were teenagers because most people were dead by the age of 35 or, or 25 even. And they're out on the battlefield when they're 14, 15 or 16. Absolutely. It is astonishing how much more sense Greek myths and Roman stories, how much more sense they make when you think they're all stories about horny teenagers. <laughs> Alexander the Great, this incredible Macedonian conqueror, and then 500 years later, Commodus, the Roman emperor, who was made very famous by the Gladiator film. They used to dress up as their heroes. It's not just that you, you're interested in them, you, you want to transform into them yourselves. I love the idea of becoming a hero, becoming a bigger hero than you are taking on a mantle. I actually don't believe I'm admitting this to you, but I did buy a gold headband <laughs> when I was about 10, which I probably wore until I was about 19, you know. I thought it gave me, you know, a little tiny edge of the, of the Wonder Woman. Neil, did you ever dress up? Did you ever sort of do any kind of cosplay before when, when you were a kid? I mostly just remember being disappointed. I definitely tried tying towels around my neck as capes and being very disappointed when normally they would just sort of untie themselves because knotting <laughs> ties is, and towels is really hard. There's an image I'd really love to share with you. I don't know if you know this this creature. This is this is the so-called lion-headed man from the Swabian Alps in southern Germany. It just blows me away every time I see this because it's this amazing kind of mating of of the natural and the supernatural in in one form. It is so beautiful. The idea that you could see an animal and want to take on the attributes that you could meld humanity with something other than humanity to create something greater. A human who has the speed of a lion, the ferocity of a lion, the danger and attack of a lion, but still can be reasoned with, still can, can walk, still can talk. Being a hero doesn't necessarily mean being a good man or, or being a heroine, being a good woman. If you look at Hercules, he kills his entire family. And actually there's this uh, real Greek called Cleomedes. Um, and Cleomedes was a victor at the Olympics. 
Uh, he was a boxer, but he kills his opponent, so he's disqualified. And he's so furious, he comes back to um, his hometown and kills 60 boys in the hometown. So he's this sort of psycho serial killer. But he becomes a hero. They, they heroise him. So being a hero doesn't mean you have to be perfect, does it? We have to think about what heroes were for. You know, you start looking at somebody like Beowulf. Beowulf is awful. He's not a nice person. You don't like him, but yeah. he's our hero. He, he beats Grendel and Grendel's mum and then dies and killed a dragon in his old age. Here is the story of a hero, but he is not seen necessarily as somebody to emulate. It is seen as the grand deeds of somebody who was big and boastful and probably lying. I think one of the things that's fascinating about this word hero is that if you look back to its very, very earliest prehistoric origins, it seems to mean someone who saves or defends. You might be comforted to hear there's been this rather brilliant study recently with tiny babies, I mean, tiny, sort of six to ten months old, and they showed them three characters. Uh, so one was a bully, uh, one was a victim, and one was an intercessor. And almost without exception, all those babies choose the intercessor. So in a sense, they choose the hero. They don't choose the dark. They don't choose the imperfectly good. They choose the, the hero who has agency and has, a, has an opportunity to save. Absolutely. I think that's the storytelling, the communal storytelling, is one of the things that makes us human. The acceptance of story, the delight in stories. And of course, the idea that we can be better that there are intercessors between us and the darkness. Amazing. Neil, can we spend every day just sitting and talking about this stuff? <laughs> That's why we have this mad COVID lockdown world, is just to talk myths every day. <laughs>